Mr. Chairman, I just heard a voiceover saying recording was in progress, if that helps. Thank you, Fred. I think that uh, Pam has started the recording, but we're holding off until she's all set with Amherst Media. Okay, Mr. Marshall, we have 648. The attendees are coming in. Amherst Media has joined us and they are ready to go as well. You are the co-host of this meeting. Um, I see a quorum. I think you're good to go. All right, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of October 30th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.48 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to provide uh, meeting access due to economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of the meeting on the town website as soon as feasibly possible. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Fred Hartwell. Present. Um, Bruce Coldham, we believe, is absent this evening, and Lawrence Klutz notified us that he would be late arriving, if at all. Uh, Jesse Major. Present. Uh, Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Present. And I, Doug Marshall, am present as well. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment, and I will call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be taken on other, at other times when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, time is 6.51. Um, we'll start off with the first item on our agenda, which is meeting minutes. We have two sets of minutes to review this evening. Uh, one, the first one from July 31st of 2024. Did anyone have any comments on the minutes? All right, I noticed one, I think it was, a, I think it was on the first one. It's just a typo. Maybe it was on the second one. So uh, let's see. Yeah. 
Yeah, so on Pam, uh, at the bottom of page seven of the, the July 31st minutes, okay. uh, under section 10, report of the chair. Okay. Uh, second line, uh, it says he will, it should be ask Ms. Ask. Newman. A -S, the K is missing. Got it. All right, any other comments on, on this set of minutes? Johanna. Sorry, I was gonna move to approve the minutes. All right, well, uh, thank you. And Je Jesse, you're seconding? Yep, I'll second. All right. Great, uh, I, will, I will mention that it's 6.53 and it looks like Nate Malloy is joining us. Okay, we'll proceed with a vote on the July 31st minutes. Uh, Fred, you're going to be first tonight because Bruce isn't here. Fred, you are muted. I thought I, now it's unmuted. Correct. I was absent July 31st, so if needed, my vote will be yes, but I shouldn't be making the motion. All right, well, we have made the motion and seconded. So uh, you, you can abstain at the moment. Would you like Noted. to? You, you would like to abstain, right? All right. Yes. All right, Jesse. Uh, aye, approved. Thank you. Uh, Johanna. I approve. Karen? I approve. And I approve as well. All right, that's two members absent, one abstention, and four in favor. So I believe that passes. So July 31st minutes are adopted. Now we go to the September 18th minutes. And it looks like all of us were present. I did not notice any uh, issues with that set of minutes. Johanna. Move to approve the minutes. All right. Um, anybody want to second that? Jesse, I see your fingers. I will second that. Okay. Um, all right. We will go to the vote. Fred. Fred votes aye. Thank you. Jesse. Aye. Uh, Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, so that's five in favor with two absences. Great. Uh, welcome, Nate. All right, the time now is 6.56. And next item on our agenda is public comment. I see we have six attendees. This is when I usually read the names of the people I can see uh, among the public. So we have a stranger named Christine Brestrup. <laughs> we have Jennifer Taub. We have Ken Rosenthal, Maura Keene, Pam Rooney, and Rob Mora. All right, uh, members of the public, this is the time to make a comment if you would like to do so on a topic which is not going to appear later on tonight's agenda. All right, I see one hand. Uh, Pam, if we could bring over Ken Rosenthal. Thank you, Hi. Mr. Thank Hello, you. Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I take the time of the planning board only for one purpose tonight, which is to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for telling the members of the public, as well as the planning board members in advance, who are present at the meeting so that we may know what other members of the public might have an interest in anything that's coming before you. That will also help us to moderate our comments, because if we know that somebody else who might be speaking on the same topic and with the same 
a position as we, we might not choose to raise our hand. That will make things more efficient. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. You are the only government body in this town that does this. I wish others would do it, and I praise you for it. Thank you for listening. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, you know, if you want to take the time, you might attend the meetings of those other bodies and ask if they can do what we do. <laughs> I, I, I want to ask the town manager again to do that, sir. Okay. And I, All right. And I... Very good. Uh, are there any other members of the public that would like to comment? All right, I do not see any other hands. <clears throat> All right, in that case, since the next item on our agenda is scheduled for 7.05, um, we will jump down in our agenda to some of our routine uh, items going at this point to number six, which is old business. Uh, I, Pam, do we have any topics of old business not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance that did not show up in the agenda? I don't think so, Mr. Marshall. Nate, do you agree or are you aware of something? No, I agree. I don't, I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Uh, likewise, uh, same question about any new business. And I have the same answer. I'm not aware of anything, but Nate, do you agree? Agreed. Perfect. All right. Um, going next to the Form A and r subdivision applications, do we have any of those this evening? We have no a &Rs tonight and none waiting in the queue either. Okay. What about ZBA applications? Um, so I have learned about a couple of things. And Nate, you may need to help me out. I learned about these late today. And of course, the ZBA is still focused on the Wayfinders project, correct, Nate? Right. And um, I do understand that um, in November, the Shootsbury Road Solar is expected to come back, but to be asked to be continued to a date in January is my understanding. Um, I just learned that today. So Nate, you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong or misspeaking. No, that's that's right. They're <clears throat> you know they're so they they have to um, file with the conservation commission and go through that, and they're you know looking at some um, some of their other uh, plans uh, and engineering work. So they will ask to be have that continue. Yep. And then Mission Cantina is expected to come before the ZBA in early November. Uh, they've had a change of ownership there, so they need to accept a new, uh, submit a new management plan. And then briefly, I can tell you that 19 Research Drive is also expected to go in front of the ZBA at that early um, November meeting. Um, and my understanding is that they have a second floor space in the building that they are going to convert to uh, living space for some of their personnel. Okay. Uh, it doesn't sound like we would want to see any of those uh, and, and, and give any sort of recommendation to ZBA. At least that's how I react to what you've described. Uh, okay. Board members, if there's any anybody else uh, thinks we should have one of those come to a meeting, this is the time to suggest that. Okay, um, how about SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Anything coming our way? We do. We do have two of those coming up. Um, the high school track site plan review application has been submitted. Uh, it's in the very early stages of the review process. I do believe we had expected that maybe the uh, first meeting in December that would come before you. I might have that date wrong. Uh, and then the second item, we may have told you about this. We had been expecting a preliminary subdivision plan to be submitted for 422 Amity Street and indeed that was just submitted. So neither one of those have been filed with the town clerk at this point, but expect to probably 
tomorrow or Friday. All right. So those will both be coming sometime before the end of the year. That is correct. Okay. Uh, we still have three minutes to uh, to 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 spend together. Uh, um, we, we've gone up to the planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, Bruce is not here to talk about PVPC. Um, I'm actually not the person for CPAC anymore, so we can oh, change that right. on the agenda. Yeah, uh, that's Lawrence, and he's not here at least at this point. Um, Karen, anything on design review board? Um, we we had uh, the high school track to review and uh, that was interesting, but we felt that we were totally out of our league to make much comments on that, but we're excited. And then there's a little uh, shop graf graphite sh gra graphic shop on Triangle Street, which is changing their logo and their sign to make it clear. And uh, we approved that. And then last, we have a, a nice little bakery buttercup going in where Henian was and we asked them to come back because we're excited but there was an awful lot of yellow on their sign so they and and they seem very appreciative of the time to try to rethink that a little bit but that's coming and that's going to be reviewed the next time all right thank you all right, Pam, is there anything else we can do with 60 seconds before we hit 7.05? Um, I don't know. How long is your uh, chair report? Oh, wait, Karen has her hand raised. Yeah, it's not very yeah. long. Karen? Yeah, I, I don't know, Doug, when I should bring this, but I, I do think that we have to put um, the uh, Barry Roberts development of the Amherst dormitory on the agenda just to discuss it briefly at least at the next agenda to have a public meeting because it does seem I mean it came awfully fast and I I do wonder if there is some illegality at all in having a, a dormitory in an area that is not zoned R F at very least I think the public uh, deserves to have this be clarified a little bit so when... all right well i know you had sent an email earlier and um i believe nate had looked into that and uh, my understanding was that it is a mixed-use building it has commercial in it um and that you know we don't allow commercial in dormitories anywhere so that uh category doesn't really apply um Nate, was there anything else? Uh, I think you had said we it's been filed, and no, I said that this the decision hasn't been filed. So, you know, staff's opinion is that if the board wants to discuss this, the discussion really then is, do we want to reopen the hearing, you know, to discuss the change in possible use? But for now, you know, I thought it was pretty clear during the planning board hearings what the use was. It was understood, and then you know the decision was made. So, <clears throat> really, the discussion tonight or at any time wouldn't be about you know, what is it or isn't it in terms of uses or conditions? It's really about does the board feel like it would want to reopen the hearing because the decision hasn't been written and filed, right? So right. It's, it's in that it's in that time period where the board could have that opportunity. Um, but, you know, I thought it was under, you know, everyone understood what, what it was, uh, when, you know, when it came to the board. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess the question would be, do uh, enough board members want to reopen the hearing in order that we would vote to do that. So um, maybe I should just, I'm gonna, I guess, Nate, why don't I just do a motion and then we can vote on it and see where it goes. Okay. Um, so I'll move that we reopen the hearing uh, for the, the, for Barry Roberts's project uh, on uh, Southeast Street, the number escapes me. I don't remember the particular application number. Should yes. we say 40, 45 to 55 South Pleasant. Pleasant? Thank you, 45 to 55 South Pleasant. Jesse, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I had a question before I can vote, which is based on what you said, Nate, 
the project as we have it, you're saying does not meet the definition of dormitory. Well, we we before we have that conversation, I think we need to decide whether we want to sort of officially it, talk about this more. Isn't that right, Nate? Yeah, I mean, th there was there was no question about what it was when it was coming back before the board. If that was something that needed to be brought up, it would have been brought up. Right. That, I just want to make sure I understand correctly what we're talking about, because, okay, enough. Okay. So I made a motion. Um, if somebody, if there's anybody that supports that motion, this is the time to second it. If no one seconds it, we will move on. I second it. And um, I, I agree just if, Nate, if a dormitory cannot be a dormitory, if there is commercial space in it, then it's not a, then of course the, the question is clear. I just wasn't, it all came so fast and I just wanna make sure that we don't set a precedent of uh, agreeing that's, that this sort of thing can go when it's not in our bylaws. So it's just unclear to me. That's why I second that we reopen this. Okay. All right, um, Fred, I see your hand. Fred, you are muted. My bad. I, I think I'm inclined not to reopen it. Um, I was concerned about the way that it was covered in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Um, I thought it would we and I know Nate, I sent you an email on this. Um, my impression was that, uh, and this is this can, is in regard to whether or not that project uh, is reviewable and the extent to which it's reviewable under the town uh, rental registration bylaw. And my impression was that we changed those conditions to make it clear that um, that uh, that it is subject to the bylaw. And uh, if Amherst College wants to uh, pursue options under that bylaw to seek an exemption, they're clear to do that as any la any landlord could do. But uh, we are not just simply giving them a buy on it. Now that's the way I understood our action. And if I'm incorrect, then I would change my position and vote to reopen it. Nate, do you have a clear sense of where we left that question? No, I, I, I when Fred emailed me, I, I thought that's the way it was discussed as well. And so sometimes you know, the article may summarize or miss a key point or a phrase of that. And so um, I think someone else actually emailed me about the article. And I, I feel like um, depending on how, you know, what you read it or how you read into it, then you might have a different impression of what was discussed at the meeting, the hearing. But, um, you know, okay. I thought the board covered all the, the conditions and the discussion, you know, pretty thoroughly. There was, you know, um, I, I, I thought by the time we were done with it, we understood everything that was happening. Right. Um, and I have not seen minutes for that meeting yet. Um, I'm, I assume they're in the queue, right, Pam? Uh, they're almost done. I was this close to getting them done, but you wouldn't have had them in this packet. It was just today that I was trying to wrap them up. Okay. But that portion is done. I can, I can tell you that that portion of 4555 South Pleasant Street, that public hearing portion is done. It is complete. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Fred, I see your hand again. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted, I, I was pretty sure that, uh, of my memory. I just, I'm, Nate, thank you for uh, confirming that that's, that I was correct in what I uh, surmised. Uh, and uh, that being the case, I will uh, vote against the motion to reopen. Okay. Um, Karen? So Amherst College clearly in one of the publications says 
uh, kind of advertises this as a dormitory. And I think there's a difference between whether it should be registered or, I, I mean, does, doesn't the town at some point had put into the bylaws that we cannot have dormitories in any uh, air district that is not uh, zoned as um, RF? That is the question. If uh, it can, it is not a dormitory, if there's commercial space in it, then it's clear. Then I also don't want to reopen it. But if it is a dormitory and we aren't allowed to have dormitories in RF without a special permit, then, you know, we're going against the law if we just let this slide. And it, we're setting a precedent saying we're disregarding this and anybody can build a big building and put all the lease to UMass or something like that. Uh, and we have no control of it. So we do have to clarify that. And I, I'm not sure. I think that we, uh, that's the question, Nate. And I think you know this. All right. So Karen, you would you, you still support reopening the hearing? Yes, I think I do. Okay. All right. So is there any more discussion about whether to reopen the hearing or not? Uh, we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Pam and Nate, am I correct that uh, a simple majority of the board present are adequate to reopen to to reopen the hearing at a later date? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So we have uh, five members present. Three of us would need to vote yes in order to reopen the hearing. All right, so I'll start. Uh, I guess, Fred, I'll just start with you again. I'll vote no. All right. Thank you. Jesse? Uh, I will vote yes. I... OK. Uh, Johanna? No. Karen? Yes. All right, and I was a no. That is three opposed and two in favor. Um, my motion fails. All right, so that was not on the agenda tonight. <laughs> I guess that's old business not anticipated 48 mm -hmm. hours in advance. Yes. All right, um, time now is 7.15. We'll go back to the next item on the agenda. And that is item three, public hearing, zoning amendment. So we will, I will read the, pre the preamble. Uh, okay, time 716. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the following proposal. University Drive Overlay District. To consider amending the zoning bylaw by adopting the University Drive Overlay District as Article 17 and amending the official zoning map by adding the University Drive Overlay District. The Overlay District would include properties on the east and west sides of University Drive between Northampton Road and Amity Street and establishes its own requirements for mixed use buildings, including dimensional standards, sta uh, standards and conditions and design guidelines. Do we have any board member disclosure? Okay. Uh, for the applicant presentation, I think, Nate, were you going to give us the sort of rundown on where this has gone since uh, we last talked about it? Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. <clears throat> Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. And so, you know, just a little backstory you know, the planning board worked on this uh, last year, it went to town council. 
as a zoning amendment and on um and then on uh monday september 23rd town council referred it to the planning board and community resources committee as you know a zoning amendment so the hearing needs to be opened uh, by the end of november the 27th and then within 21 days by the close of the planning board hearing a report needs to be made to town council so you know this hearing is being held within that time frame and the board can continue the hearing uh, to discuss the overlay uh, so what was being proposed is an overlay district i'll share my screen If that, uh, let's see, is, if that's visible for everyone. I can see it. The, uh, as, as Doug mentioned, the overlay is outlined in black here. So here's Amity Street on the north, University Drive and Northampton Road. So the overlay does not change the existing zoning in place. There's, um, you know, base zoning. There's also a research and development overlay. So everything that's there would stay in place and the overlay would encompass the area within the, the outline. Uh, it only applies to mixed use buildings. And so I'll go to the actual text of the overlay. I'm gonna walk through this. Um, so, you know, it establishes its own requirements for mixed use buildings. So it has dimensional standards, conditions and design guidelines that apply only for mixed use buildings. So any other use that would um, be permitted here would follow the existing zoning that's in place. The purpose is to encourage housing and economic development. And so, you know, the board discussed this in terms of what, what's the right mix of non-residential and residential space. Uh, and so that's, you know, the purpose is really, you know, kind of summarize that conversation. We established the district. We came up with dimensional standards unique to just the overlay and mixed use buildings. Um, there's no waivers. So there's no footnote, you know, M or A. Uh, there's no additional lot area required for um, units. Uh, so it is a little bit flexible. Uh, minimum lot size is pretty small, 40 feet of frontage, 12,000 square feet. We have a maximum building coverage of 60% and a maximum lot coverage of 85%. Uh, and setbacks are by the street. So on Amity Street is 20 feet. University Drive is 24 feet. Northampton Road is 25 uh, and um, side and rear is 10. The right of way is 90 to 100 feet wide. And so, you know, uh, on the northern end of this part of the overlay, you know, there'll be about 150 feet between, you know, if buildings are built right on the setback line. And so it is a pretty wide right of way and setback. The setbacks are meant to encourage reuse of the access drive on the west side of University Drive, and then also create a nice green belt where there's existing trees to preserve the trees. On the east side, there is the swift way, the, the multi-use bike path, and the setback allows for all of that to remain. Uh, we have a building height of six floors or 65 feet. Um, similar to what we have in the bylaw, building height does not include rooftop mechanicals, um, you know, or certain equipment. And we say the sixth floor shall be stepped back a distance from the street in order to minimize scale. There's no prescribed distance. That would be something reviewed during permitting. The mixed use buildings are through site plan review. Um, you know, what we have here is 75% of the street facing facade of the first or ground floor facing University Drive or Northampton Road shall be any permit or non-residential use to a depth of 24 feet. So the idea here was to encourage you know, shops facing the street along a majority of uh, the first or ground floor. Um, we do allow parking in the in the additional space. So if they need to, you know, have parking inside the building, outside of this required 75%, they can. Um, we do allow multiple buildings on a property. We do want to have some open space um, as part of the project. Again, we're not having um, you know, a certain percentage, but there's, you know, when it's going through site plan review, these standards and conditions will help the, the permit granting authority make those decisions. Um, the multi-use path on the west side of University Drive is something that, uh, you know, the setback is meant to encourage and it's something that, you know, staff and the planning board would talk with applicants about. Uh, we also want outdoor amenity spaces. In terms of parking, we're allowing flexible parking. So there's no on-street parking allowed on 
University Drive and there's not many neighborhoods close by for that allow on-street parking. And so the idea really is that a developer or an applicant um, you know, has to come and be ready to provide, you know, what we have here is a study and a management plan um, and any shared or leased agreements to show that there's adequate parking on the site for the development. And so um, we're waiving the current sections of the bylaw um, and we're not saying that they have more than, you know, right now in our shared or leased parking section, you have to have, you know, 120% of what you think is necessary and all these conditions for shared parking. We're basically saying it's it's flexible here. And that could be, you know, they show that in their lease agreements, they don't allow any cars. And so every tenant knows up front that they don't have cars or that they, you know, have a one-to-one -one parking ratio or they have shared parking with another property um, nearby. Uh, the design guidelines here, you know, we're saying the design review principles that are currently in the bylaw um, shall be applied. We're saying a majority of the front facade should be along the front setback. Um, you know, we, we, again, these aren't, you know, um, overly prescriptive. We're going through a downtown design standards process right now, but here, you know, a few that will help with uh, the treatment of the building. So, you know, overhanging awnings, and canopies between the first and second floor, like a horizontal sign band, uh, variations in architecture and change in plane to break down, um, you know, a massive wall and so or a large flat facade. So there's, you know, again, that's something that the board would look at during permitting. Um, surface or open parking lots, you know, are meant to be to the side or behind buildings. Um, you know, to the extent possible, parking lots would be consolidated to reduce curb cuts. Rooftop mechanical equipment will be screened from view. And so that's something that, you know, is, is becoming more and more important as uh, there's different types of mechanical equipment. And then again, just, you know, mechanical systems, other things should be placed in a way that they're minimally visible. And so that that's the extent of the overlay language. Um, and then, you know, it applies again in this area for, for mixed use buildings. So it's an opportunity for someone who would propose a mixed use building to use the overlay. Okay, thank you, Nate. Um, so the board talked a lot about this last year. Uh, we've only had a change of one person on the board since we talked about this a lot. So I don't, uh, I, I'm not really expecting a lot of conversation about sort of the basic proposal. Um, and since this has been referred back to us from town council, and as I read in all the preambles for these hearings, uh, so that interested members of the public can comment. Uh, that's, to my mind, that's the, the first objective of this hearing is to allow the public to comment on this proposal. Um, but as uh, any of you that listened to town council when they referred this back to us, uh, heard, there were a number of comments made by counselors about the proposal before they voted. And um, uh, I don't know if you've all listened to that. Uh, I heard it the first time in live, and the second time I, I did go back and listen to it again. So we may want to talk about some of their comments and what we think about that, whether the concerns are uh, valid and we should be changing something about the proposal or whether we uh, actually think they're not uh, significant or valid enough to change something. Jesse. Is now the time to do that or do you want to wait till after? Well, I, th I thought maybe I would call for public comment first and just hear what the public who have, uh, who are here want to say. Okay, so why don't I go ahead and do that? Um, now's the time for the now nine members of the public that are in the uh, uh, on my list here. If you have a comment you want to make about this proposal, now's the time to do it. Uh, I will I will say in advance, I expect that we will continue this hearing. It, this is not the only, uh, part of this hearing that will occur. 
So you, if you don't make a comment tonight and you want to do it when we continue the hearing later this fall, uh, you will have another chance. Okay, Pam, can you bring over Jonathan Slater? Hi, Jonathan. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, you'll need to unmute, unmute yourself and give us your name and your street address in Amherst. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Jonathan Slater. I'm the Director of Facilities for Cooley Dickinson Hospital, and we have a, um, interest in 170 University Drive, as well as an empty lot that um, abuts Northampton Road. And uh, although this is the first time, um, thank you for the notice, uh, because this is the first time that I've heard of this communication. I've been with Cooley for almost five years now. And the only thing that I, I have in concern to this location is what we're currently struggling with for wetlands and stormwater runoff that comes off of the Route 9 um, uh, passageway. And we're experiencing groundwater into our structures and stuff. So I just want to be on record uh, for any developments in this area that we take into consideration these struggles we're having on our property currently. All right. And am I correct? Your property is on the east side of University Drive? Correct. Okay. Yeah, right. we, we're on the corner of, um, well, we're on, we're on University Drive directly across from the Big Y with the vacant lot on the opposite corner facing Route 9. And then there is a separate business on that corner uh, facing the intersection, which hopefully someday we can acquire. Okay. Great. Have you been in contact with the Conservation Commission at all about your groundwater issues? This is all this is all developing. Um, and this I, I reached out to Ty and Bond, who is our environmental team, and said this notice couldn't have come at a more perfect time. And I, I'm fortunate to have this opportunity to speak to the group tonight. And we do look forward to future conversations. OK. All right, uh, anything else you wanted to say? That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, are there any other members of the public that would like to comment? Okay, uh, oh yes, now we have one hand from Pam Rooney. Mm -hmm. Hi, Pam. Good evening, everyone. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I had not intended to speak, um, I, but since you're talking about this subject, I was looking at item number 17.521. The front setback, <clears throat> excuse me, on the west side of University Drive is meant to encourage the reuse of the access drive into a minimum 10 foot wide multi use pedestrian and bicycle path. And I understand that there is not necessarily response to public comment, but it would be interesting to me if if someone were to discuss the rationale behind this uh, particular item in that there is on the east side of uh, University Drive a wonderful bike pedestrian walkway called Swift Way. On the west side of uh, University Drive, there is a reasonable, not in great condition, sidewalk that extends the entire length of University Drive that is also actively used. There is a 10 or 12 foot wide planting strip that contains the existing fairly mature street trees. Why would there be a need for an additional 10 foot wide multi-use pedestrian and bicycle path in addition to all of that? Uh, and that's my question. So I would, at some point, if someone happens to talk about this, it would be great to hear the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I will mention that uh, my statement earlier that we don't respond to public comment uh, pertained per basically only to the general public comment agenda item, not 
that we wouldn't uh, respond to public comment during specific subjects that are on the agenda. So uh, I think we could respond to that. Um, um, my understanding was we wanted to have a vibrant street life along this section of uh, roadway and that having a pretty substantial setback and make, take, making use of that, that roadway to uh, e evolve away from vehicular use and to pedestrian use was uh, something we thought would be a valuable amenity in this area. Um, does anybody else want to comment about their what they remember about this, uh, Karen? Yes, I agree. And I think it's <clears throat> uh, having walkways and pedestrian ways at both sides of, the, of a street that's going to be kind of a gateway to the university is is actually welcome to have it just on one side is, you know, we're, we're hoping that this is going to be much more densely populated and the people that are populating it will really appreciate having a place to, to be, to have wide sidewalks and to be able to walk and, and get away from cars. Okay. Um, I, I, I will mention one other thing, which is right now that roadway provides vehicular access to properties all the way along that frontage. And uh, since we don't know the order in which it, things might be developed, uh, by allowing a, a building to come forward of that road, uh, if it's out of sequence, uh, could could cut off vehicular access to a neighbor. Um, so that's another reason uh, to to structure it that way. Johanna, you had a comment. Yeah, I think this came up among the town council conversation as well about how. Yep. Andy brought it up. Andy brought it up, exactly. And, you know, I think the vision is that this is a really pedestrian and bike friendly boulevard of sorts with mature street trees and a vibrant street life. Like that's the end goal. And the question is, like, I don't know the answer to this, Doug. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, but let's say we do adopt the overlay and an institution that's like in the center of the, the sides that they want to, you know, rebuild and essentially cut off that side street. How, how are there models for mitigating that is the first question. And then the second question, you know, had to do with the number of driveway cuts on University Drive and addressing the fact that vehicles may need to turn and how it influences, I think, the traffic pattern on University Drive. Um, so I think that is a point that would be worth discussing a little bit more. Um, I feel like with the Barry Roberts proposal on the corner, you know, there's the access point around the back on Amity, as well as I think two proposed cuts on University Drive. You know, I think we decided we were okay with that, but um, yeah, it's food for thought. Okay. Yeah, I thought Andy, Andy was predominantly talking about what's the process for allowing more curb cuts along there? What's sort of, what's the logistics of the road as it sort of evolves? Um, it's my understanding that town council is the body that would approve curb cuts on University Drive. And we obviously have a couple of counselors listening in tonight. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe you're not expert on that. Jesse. Yeah, on this point, and maybe Nate can add more, my memory of our conversation was that, yeah, the, the curb cut, um, not allowing more curb cuts was for historic reasons, because it was going to be a main th thoroughfare before 116 was built and that part of this would be to probably reduce or eliminate that uh, restriction on curb cuts, which would allow for all these scenarios to be fine. Um, yeah. I had some other thoughts about traffic mitigation. Maybe it'll come up later, but Nate, I sent you an email. We can talk about that some other time. Okay. Nate? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think some of there's a, a number of points raised about that setback. One is the existing sidewalk is in really poor condition and the idea is to abandon it if this were to move forward. So, you know, it's almost right on the road. It's actually really not pleasant to walk on uh, if University Drive is heavily traveled. And so to have something set back behind the trees, along the buildings, a multi-use path would be great. So the idea too is to limit, you know, to reduce the number of street crossings mid-block if people can walk on both sides to certain points and then cross. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the curb cut thing is something that, you know, if public works is okay with it, I, I don't see why if there were, you know, there'd be any restrictions to it. The Additionally, the setback, the road right of way, although it's wide, it's not centered on the road. And so if we actually had um, a small setback on that side, some of those street trees in that island would be impacted. And so if we actually want to save and have a nice, wide, generous green belt with the trees, we need actually a pretty generous setback uh, to allow that to happen. If we didn't have a setback and a building came up, they would actually come in probably right onto the curb, the closest curb to that tree belt. Um, and then there's no, you know, no room for actually having a sidewalk unless we were to cut down all those trees and then plant new ones. And so some of the discussion was, you know, how can we save those trees, have a nice streetscape, allow for, you know, if, if it is multi-unit housing, right, uh, a three-foot sidewalk is not adequate, but a 10-foot one would be great to have on both sides of the road, uh, you know, and reduce street crossings. Okay. So, Pam, that's some thoughts about that particular uh, aspect of the proposal. Um, are there other? Oh, yeah. Okay, Fred, go ahead. Um, well, another thing that uh, came up at the council meeting, uh, and uh, Bruce Colden at uh, the last time we discussed this. Uh, uh raised it as well and that concerns uh the big y parcel at the south end uh on the west side and um uh, whether this uh by creating what is potentially a a higher use uh could inadvertently I'm, I'm think we would all agree it would be inadvertent but it could it could compromise the market continuance of big y in that particular location and so there was uh there's been some conversation <laughs> around uh around uh moving the uh boundary uh somewhat to the north to prevent that from happening. So uh, I'm not sure exactly where I come out on this, but I, I, I think there's a valid concern here that we need to discuss. Okay. Uh, so uh, does anybody want to talk about that, that set of comments? There were a number of counselors who brought that up. Uh, Jesse. Yeah, I was going to mention this as well. Um, I did listen to that, the council meeting and read the article about it. Uh, well, I don't totally agree with the concern. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't respect that concern and move the boundary. And then that site can come by special permit if they really want to do a different project. So, Nate, you had an idea about pushing it back some number of feet, right? That would get past the big Y, essentially. If that's what helps us move this project forward, I have no objection to, to changing the overlay in that way. Okay. Uh, Nate? Yeah, I wasn't suggesting moving the overlay boundary. I was suggesting changing a standard or condition that say within 300 feet of that, of Northampton Road or that intersection, the ground floor has to be 100% you know, non non residential space. So right now we have a seventy five percent to a certain depth. But you know what I was thinking if I, um, I'll just share my screen. You know, if the concern and and also the buildings have you know in Hadley too. So it has to you know, depending on how, what happens with this permitting, 
but the idea would be if there's concern, you know, that's within this distance, anything that's redeveloped in within this distance has to be 100% ground floor non-residential. Um, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, the idea too would be that there's plenty of space to build in front of the big Y or they could, you know, there's a few options for the property. Uh, there is a stop and shop not too far down the street. So to say it would become a food desert. I don't know if that's accurate, but um, yeah, I mean, so anyways, that, that was my idea. There could be others, but, you know, I was trying to think of ways to, continue the overlay and not have it, you know, miss the corner, but still have some conditions that could allow for a bigger retail space. All right. Um, Jesse, your hand is still up. I just follow up one comment. I, I, I do agree with the point that the big Y and CVS are, you know, extremely heavily used. I'm there at least two, two or three times a week also. And like, it's always full. Mm -hmm. And so, while I don't think the result would be that would disappear, if that's a concern, I think we it's reasonable for us to try and mitigate that, whatever that might mean, including the parking lot, which serves a really important function there as well. Okay. Uh, Fred. Yeah, I would uh, <clears throat> I would agree with any approach on this. I think Nate's suggestion has a lot of merit. Uh, just. Uh, you know, as long as we address it, I think uh, it'll go a lot further. Okay. Uh, I was going to mention that, uh, you know, I, I, I agree that the comment about it causing a food des desert is not really, uh, really substantive, I guess, given the location of the stop and shop so nearby. Um, but I also, it also occurred to me that the, the location where the hangar is located right now, I believe was originally a supermarket. And so, you know, if there are, there is the opportunity for another supermarket to happen in that area with an existing building. Now, obviously our, uh, our overlay boundary includes that property for all we know you know, the property with the hangar in it and uh, the Greenfield Savings could get redeveloped as well. Um, I guess I was more concerned about uh, the downside of limiting this uh, just because uh, housing that doesn't happen here uh, may have an impact on the number of students in the neighborhoods where people don't really want them. And if we minimize the amount of potential for this area, uh, it's more urgent that we consider other areas where we would be willing to, uh, let's say, loosen the zoning. Um, and we, you know, it's, it seems pretty clear the students are uh, rational actors in that they'd like to be as close to the university as possible. So uh, this seemed like an ideal area because of the topography, the proximity to UMass, the good bus service, um, and in fact, you know, having the having the big Y and CVS right there. So I'm I'm not opposed to trying to figure out what we can do to uh, encourage food to be provided in this area, whether it has to be big Y, I don't, I'm not sure I really care. But, um, you know, I, I am sensitive to, well, if we, if not here, where? And uh, that is a, is a question that, you know, this area is, doesn't have much in the way of neighborhoods uh, and constituents who are going to oppose housing that can uh, hold a bunch of people, probably mostly students, uh, but that's going to be that many fewer students who are out competing for properties in neighborhoods that none of us really want. So um, that's my two cents for the moment. Uh, the next person who had their hand up, I thought, OK, I guess it's Johanna. It's you at the moment. Thanks. I will say I was struck by how 
little conversation there was in the town council's deliberation about the added housing that could come from this overlay district. Like that to me feels like a really important issue in our town. This is designed primarily to address that issue. And again, I was just struck that that wasn't acknowledged in that conversation by our town's governing body. Um, I agree that I'm not worried about the food desert piece. It doesn't feel substantive. I know there was some concern that maybe the stop and shop would close it's all hypothetical at this point. And um, I feel like, I can't help but feel like we are being precious about a strip mall. And I think we can do better in terms of the buildings that we are encouraging for the future of Amherst. So um, I want the overlay district to succeed if we have to take the big Y lot out of the overlay in order to get the votes for this to succeed. You know, I'm not going to fall on my sword for it. Um, but I hope that it doesn't come to that and that we can perhaps find some kind of intermediate ground where we can continue to keep that very large parcel in the overlay district as, you know, the potential of being redeveloped. Um, but I also really want to make sure we have the votes to win. Okay. Uh, Jesse. Thanks. Uh, I guess I have one more thought that's leaning, pushing me more towards trying to remove that parcel, which is thinking about the other sites that have gone up in town. And this came up in the council meeting also about how the commercial space is largely, they're, they're fine to leave it unoccupied for some number of, months or years and presumably that will happen in this district as well until there's the need or the right tenant or whatever um and that made me feel like big y cbs the other four small stores that are there why not take that action take that first step to preserve those and then again, if in the future, if the rest of it all gets developed, we can reconsider, the owner can reconsider and try and get something built anyway through 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 other mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, I'm thinking also about having this move forward from the town council discussion that felt like there was going to be a lot of resistance to a plan that didn't try and mitigate this scenario. Okay, Fred. Yeah, um, I, Doug, I, I really appreciate your comments, uh, and I, nobody has been more enthusiastic than me in terms of uh, pursuing this overlay and pursuing the uh, uh, development in this part of the town to take uh, market pressure off neighborhoods. Uh, I completely agree with your analysis. Uh, I think Nate's uh, suggestion really connects all the dots. Um, it uh, uh, would uh, avoid the probably the unintended effects at in this particular location. Meanwhile, uh, uh, preserving the attractiveness of the overlay district in general, and uh, simply by a, a, a very sensible way of, of conditioning uh, what happens uh, uh, in this dimension. We have part of the overlay also addresses, has a dimensional uh, limitation regarding the north end. So there's, there's precedent in the uh, uh, work here to uh, to address this, and I, I think Nate's proposal is the is the way to go. Okay, um, Karen, you're next. Yeah, I was going to agree, and uh, Fred, you beat me to it. I do think we have to push this forward. This is a really important way to 
to uh, mitigate the housing need that's that's oppressing the whole town. But um, your proposal, Nate, that maybe the big Y CVS that we at that particular place require a hundred percent on the ground floor. I think that's also that that would also keep it a little bit flexible because maybe those buildings want to put residential above them, but those stores would be preserved. I like that idea. I also think we should try to see if if this is a compromise that would be acceptable in that it would save those particular uh, very desirable commercial spaces, but wouldn't take this whole big chunk of land out of the overlay. Okay, Karen. Uh, Jesse. Thanks. Uh, well, I completely agree with your sentiment, Karen. I have to point out the data we have in front of us, which is, I believe, not one of the stores that was in place in any of the lots that got developed in town has come back or been preserved. There are different things, but not one of those businesses is still in town. The liquor store moved down the hill, I think, but that's it. And and yeah, that's a real concern I would have also. Right? We can think we're trying to preserve these same shops, but I think that's not realistic. Maybe in a different supermarket would open, sure, but we it's really unknown. Okay. Uh, Johanna. Yeah, I was going to, I guess, say the same thing. Um, you know, I think Nate's scenario would ensure that there's commercial space there, but it doesn't ensure that Big Y is there. And I don't think they're like, I have no idea. I'm not an architect, but I don't think we could just like add five stories on top of the existing structure. That's not how it works. Um, so there would be a transition time and it would probably be a different tenant. And if the intention is, you know, to save big Y and save the strip mall with its parking lot, Nate's proposed middle path does not accommodate that. Is my understanding. It doesn't, it doesn't insure it. It doesn't insure it. Thank you. Right. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I think part of what we're talking about is uh, how much change are we willing to, you know, allow? And the, the reason we were talking about change is that the current conditions are not satisfactory. <laughs> so, Something, you know, if you think about how to change something, things will change. Uh, Nate, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there's all, you could have other conditions in terms of limiting the use in that area too. But again, it doesn't necessarily ensure that it's big Y, right? You could limit the redevelopment to non-residential to certain use categories in our bylaw. That becomes pretty, um, you know, <clears throat> pretty strict. Um, just changing subjects in terms of the overlay, I will say that since this was proposed and you know staff has discussed it with a few developers, the height, I think it had been asked if 65 feet was really enough to accommodate six floors. And we've learned that it, it, it isn't the way they, they build now. So 70 feet is really what's necessary. So if this were to move forward and we want six floors, I would recommend that we would have a 70 foot, maybe even 71, I mean, they're right now they're at 69 feet. So they do 10, 10 feet of residential floor and it's like 16 to 18 for a commercial. And so for a residential floor, they frame it out, say a 10 feet and they drop everything underneath that to run utilities. And so then you get an eight foot ceiling. So they have two feet of, you know, framing of, you know, duct work of whatever. So they really need 10 feet uh, per residential floor and you know anywhere from 15 you know 15 is probably like a low end now to 18 for commercial the way they frame it with you know how they build you know first floor and then up above so um yeah i, I think that 65 we thought might be possible but i think even bruce asked that and it's a, it's a little it's a, it's a little low yeah uh jesse Thanks. Uh, I have to back up for one second. And maybe this is a question we can bring up next time if we're going to discuss again. Yeah, I figured we'd talk about this maybe another 25 minutes, sure. maybe another half hour. Question for you, Nate. It's hard for me to tell just from looking at the plan. If we were to somehow not include the big Y lot, 
what percent difference are we talking about? And like, you know, if we projected all, absolutely everything got built to six stories, how many units is that? And then without the big Y lot, what are we talking about? It looks to me maybe eight to 10% difference. But again, if you can try and guesstimate that for us, it might be useful to, to think about. Yeah, okay. I, I think the, the question would be, if my screen's visible, the, um, Oh, let me actually do markup for uh, through. Uh... Oh, where's my annotation control? Um, the big Y, the area is here. Here's the red line right here. If you see that, so the, yep. the properties yep. here, the question would be, would you want to then exclude this corner here or is it really just these properties? So, you know, then there's additional properties to the south of it along Northampton Road. And so, you know, I think what we've said all along Going back to you know Mr. Slater's comments, there is a fair number of wetlands and resource areas here, and so you know it's pretty strategic in terms of how you have to develop. So 422 Amity Street, which has been under review by the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission, you know has to spend you know the Conservation Commission is still discussing it because they have to, they really like to see some you know um, robust stormwater management programs and systems on site. And so, you know, at one point I said, well, you know, if we could get six projects here, a thousand beds, I mean, you know, excluding this you're, you know, there is, it's a fair, it's a fairly large paved area that could be redeveloped. I mean, I don't, I can't say what, you know, what's the upshot of that or the impact. I mean, I think, you know, would this be the next site to be developed? I'm not sure. I, I, you know, my guess is if I were big Y, I would be just pretty excited to have, you know, a lot of neighbors within walking distance that would be using my store. Um, but that might not, you know, be the kind of the rationale of the owners. Um, you know, big Y doesn't own the property. So there's different, a different owner. Big Y is a, a tenant. I mean, honestly, they might be in a 25 or 50 year commercial lease that runs until 2040. And so they're guaranteed space there for, you know, for another 20, 15 years. Uh, most commercial leases are for a minimum of 25 years, 2025. So I, I don't know that scenario, but yeah, I mean, so I get, to me, the question would be if you're eliminating here, you know, is it is it just these properties or would it be something else? I mean, I, I you know, you know how, how does that overlay look if we're missing those two properties? So I don't. Yeah, anybody have any thoughts about that? I mean, I, I, I don't, consider the, what is it, an auto store and uh, the ginger garden. I guess those are the two businesses along Route 9 there. And um, is there, I don't remember if there's a third along there, but- Yes, so those, here's, the, those here's what the properties are. The, um, yeah, there's actually another auto parts store right here. It's- um, Yeah, I've always wondered why there were two so close together. But but anyway, those the, none of those feel uh, like essential services uh, that are not available, you know, somewhere else in town or or within a mile in in uh, Hadley. So, you know, personally, I would probably keep them in the in the overlay, um, but but they're going to feel like kind of sort you know outliers. Uh, by being separated by the big Y property. And maybe maybe that's not what we want. Um, I guess, uh, does anybody else have any comments about this at this point? I know uh, when I went, when I was listening again, there was a comment from one member of the council saying, hey, gee, why didn't, why aren't you allowing apartment buildings? Um, and, um, you know, we talked a lot about that. Uh, it seemed like in the end, we, we wanted to try to have a relatively vibrant street life and um, didn't think we could get that with a sort of uh, a non-public first floor space that an apartment building would give you. Um, I think it was that same member who said, well, do you really have to require uh, commercial space on the first floor, couldn't you just require the first floor to be built with the high floor to floor 
so that it could be commercial, but you can also allow residential there. And if the commercial market gets so uh, such demand for commercial space, well, they could rip out the, the residential and put in commercial or, or use it for residential. Um, you know, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, you know, uh, you know, I could argue that uh, both ways, I think, um, because it's it's important to get every single unit we can. Uh, but I, th I think it, it uh, I shared the preference for having some street life down there. Uh, I don't see that I've jogged anybody to say anything up oh, there's 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 Johanna okay go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the counselor in question said no matter what she was planning on putting forward an amendment to talk about apartments at CRC. So I imagine they'll have a conversation and we'll see where that shakes out. But, I, you know, I feel like we discussed it at length yeah. and, um, you know, there are pros and cons to both approaches, but I think there's a reason we proposed mixed use. Right. Um, there was one other piece that came up um, that I kind of flagged as a thing to make sure we touch on um, that was mentioned at town council. And it was this idea that there was concern that these buildings would be dorms and that they would only house students. I come back to the idea that housing is housing and that if we create off-campus housing that is mostly for students, it alleviates the pressure on neighborhoods. Um, but I thought maybe it would be worth talking about that just a little bit as well. Yeah, uh, I, I heard that as well. Um, I was I was dismayed by that because it seemed to me that if you're going to put students anywhere, this would be a great place to put them. <laughs> and and you know, and I and it 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 is better to have them here rather than somewhere else where they're they're the neighbors don't want them. Um, you know, I will say in terms of the sort of relieving the pressure uh, conversation, you know, I think we we shouldn't be really saying that this this area in and of itself would relieve the pressure. Uh, you know, there is probably out there are thousands of students who would like to live in Amherst and can't or haven't yet found a house to to live in, and so. This is a good start, uh, it, but I don't think it'll solve the problem. It won't immediately suck all the students out of the neighborhoods. It won't cause all the rents to drop um, and your property value to drop, <laughs> which is comes with the rental market softening. Um, but uh, it's an awfully, it, it, it seems to me it's a shame if we don't take advantage of this area and the sort of political opportunity that it seems to offer. Jesse. Thanks, yeah, I largely agree. And I think it's really the same conversation that came up with the project in town last time. Um, I think right now, any new units that get built, students are gonna move in, whatever shape or size, whatever it takes, because there's so much pressure. And this is just the first step in getting us to have enough housing so that there's not pressure for single family turnover. And I think that's what many of us are concerned about. Um, that's also why to me, if we make the overlay a little bit smaller without the corner lot, it's not a huge crisis. Yes, more units is more units. But again, this is probably just, I hope the first in many of these type of projects that we're gonna move toward. Okay, Nate. Yeah, I mean, to address the apartment concern, I mean, we had discussed it, I think at one point um, last year, but you know, you could allow that a secondary building uh, not facing the street could be an apartment building, right? So that the the front building that has the, you know, the frontage is, a, is required to be a mixed use building, but there's flexibility with a second building, or if it has fewer, you know, a shorter frontage piece. Um, and so, you know, there's probably ways to also, you know, have, you know, different standards or considerations there. I just, you know, I was thinking that it doesn't, you know, if that's something that is discussed and the planning board wants to, maybe there's a way to allow, you know, two different uses 
um, you know, depending on how you want to arrange them or think that a site would be redeveloped. I mean, there might be limited opportunity where there's actually, you know, two different buildings, but it could be that, you know, maybe in three instances, you get an apartment building instead of, you know, having a second mixed use building. But. Yeah, well, the lots are so deep. Um, there, it does seem possible, at least just looking at the plan. Right. Um, but there's so much wetlands back there that I think that we're still going to be limited on how much of the site can be developed. So, right. you know, do you really think we can, there's some opportunity for that? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if I'm looking right, it's only, it would only be a few, few, um, a yeah. few sites, right, where that would actually be a possibility. It just, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to, you know, especially if we have a mixed use requirement up front, typically a developer would want a certain amount of parking then both for residents and the non-residential space. And so, you know, all those, all those factors contribute, right? So you could say, oh, well, let's allow a second building that's this. Well, that might not, even if we allow it, it might never happen because we're requiring a certain percentage of mixed use and they want a certain amount of parking or, you know, somebody wants some open space too. So, yeah. Okay. Jesse. I guess I would be inclined not to consider that. It seems like it's overcomplicating what our vision was to happen here. And I also feel like designers and architects are clever. They're gonna come up with, oh, we have a 10 foot deep building in front that meets the requirements and we have a big building in back that's an apartment or whatever scenario we haven't imagined that someone else will, that will really go against the point of what we're trying to do um, to, to gain six more apartments or whatever the small gain would be. So to me, it feels like not necessarily a step. And yeah, as Johanna pointed out, we can see what the CRC comes up with. So Nate, um, you know, we haven't, I'm not sure I've experienced this, this process before. So we're gonna have our hearing. And I guess at the end of the hearing, we will write a recommendation of some sort letter to the council and CRC is gonna have its hearing. Um, you know, if there are changes needed, what body, does that uh, before town council votes on it? Or does, you know, what kind of, how does it work? Or it's not like we're the house and, and CRC is the Senate and we need to conference and agree on something that we then send to town council. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I think previously at one point, it's been a few years ago, there was a concurrent hearing of the planning board and CRC. And right now, you know, there's parallel tracks and, you know, the idea would be the planning board could write its own recommendations and have its own draft bylaw that's separate than what the CRC recommends. Um, you know, I think continuing the hearing, I, you know, I, I talked to uh, the CRC and said, you know, at some point the planning board and CRC could actually continue it to the same date. And so that, you know, if not your next one, but the third meeting could be where both boards meet at the same time uh, so you can have a conversation together um, and then still develop separate recommendations and a bylaw, right? So it, in the end, the planning board will have a set of recommendations to council. The CRC will have a set of recommendations and it could be on the same bylaw or it could be on the bylaw that the planning board thinks, you know, is most appropriate and the CRC might have something different. And so, um, yeah, so for me right now, you know, if, if moving forward, we could, you know, continue it to a date certain. And then if there's changes we want to see like the building height or if there's setbacks or other things, we had a few points I had noted, but you know, those changes could be made. Uh, and then, you know, if there's other comments or questions that come in, those could be discussed. So, um, you know, that's where, that's how I, I, you know, I'd continue on with your discussion. If there's, you know, things that need to be changed, you'd like to see changed, that's changed. And then at some point we can um, coordinate with the, the CRC. So, you know, they need to pick this up in November. My idea was to continue it past their first hearing date so that then, you know, there's an opportunity to hear what they discussed and then the planning board could discuss it again. Okay. So let's see, November. I, there's a November 20th meeting. Yeah. Uh, is, there and, a, is there a November 6th meeting too? There is, but I don't, the CRC won't have heard this yeah. before the 6th. Okay. 
and then so to lay out the schedule there's a december 4th meeting of the planning board and that looks like it would be a hearing for the high school track and for the preliminary subdivision plan for 422 amity and then it's december 18th which i still have as could be university drive so it could be november 20th and you know if there isn't much to talk about it's a short um, discussion and then it could be continued again to december 18th um, there's a few other things that may happen on november 20th as well uh, but you know those two dates november 20th and december 18th are available and then you know and then with the holidays you know they right i want to say like let's wait until january i think we should have at least another discussion yeah well we seems like we will definitely still be talking about this next year okay all right um are there any more comments from the board for, for this topic this evening all right. Are there any more comments from the public on this topic? I saw a momentary hand that then disappeared. Uh, okay, uh, let's bring Jonathan Slater back. I guess the only thing that I would like to make sure, and I appreciate all this conversation, is that um, I did get this notice for this particular overlay, but I heard other comments about University Drive. How do I uh, make sure that uh, we get updates on when future meetings are impacting this area? Um, is there some way that I can be a part of that um, communication moving forward? Um, so we send out notices when we start for, for when the hearings start, but I, Nate or Pam, do we send out notices for each continuation or we rely on the abutter to pay attention to what we talk about and when we continue the hearing in, in the meeting, is that right? Right, so the hearing has to be continued to a time and date certain which would need to happen before we would continue on with the meeting here. Right. So typically we don't, we don't also, we don't notify abutters or property owners of zoning changes. This case was different because it was a discrete number of property owners affected by the proposed overlay. And so, um, you know, we have your name and, you know, we typically would recommend someone to subscribe to uh, Amherst uh, on the website. You can subscribe to be notified when agendas are posted. And I think you could, single out if it's just the planning board so if any you know planning board is talking about zoning you'd get a notification that an agenda was posted it's not specific to university drive but you then have to look at the agenda typically staff wouldn't promise keeping track of who wants to be notified at every meeting um no i sort of meeting. respect that and also that extra comment i'll go ahead and i'll get signed up but um, that's but, what i need to understand so thank you well, i was gonna jonathan, say you know jonathan keep... the other thing is before we're done tonight we're gonna name the date and the time where we're going to continue talking about this. So if you're able to stay with us until we close this topic for this evening, which isn't the end of the meeting, yeah. uh, you'll hear when we're going to come back and talk about it again. I appreciate the extra time to share that information with me. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I was also going to say, Jonathan, uh, my email is Malloy, N M A L L O Y N at Amherst, M A dot gov. And you can send me an email. I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. I don't see any other hands from the public. And uh, at this point, uh, sounds like we should continue the hearing to November 20th. Um, are we going to go at 7.05 again or maybe 7 o'clock since we had to kill five minutes earlier? <laughs> Can, can, will that work for you, Nate? Yeah, yeah, my, um, my uh, yeah, that's fine. Seven o'clock will work? Okay. We can always start um, later. We just can't start earlier than a posted time. Right, right. Well, I'm just thinking we should uh, continue to seven o'clock on, uh, mm -hmm. on the 20th. Okay, so I, I'd like to make a motion that we continue this hearing to November 20th at 7 p.m. Jesse. I'll second that. All right. Thank you. 
anybody else want to talk about that motion or anything else about this topic? Johanna. Sorry if I haven't missed this, but has CRC scheduled their meeting on it yet? Uh, Nate? I thought it was going to take place on the 12th uh, or the 19th, so um, they would have that discussion before. Great. Thank you. Okay. I do see hands raised. Uh, yeah, now, I, now I see a couple of hands from CRC members. Uh, Pam, you got your name, your hand up first. We'll go ahead with you. Hello, Pam. Hi, Pam Rooney. Uh, the CRC hearing on University Drive is going to be held on November 12. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, it, and if Mr. Slater wants to be notified of that, that would be great. Okay, so November 12th, what time is your meeting? I think it's 6.30 p.m. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see any other hands uh, by anyone. We have a motion to continue and a second. In that case, we'll go. We'll go on and vote on continuing. Uh, starting with you, Fred. Uh, aye. Thank you, Jesse. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. All right, Karen. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Five in favor, two absent. All right, time is 819. Um, seems like it's time to do take a break, maybe. People want to do that, take a five minute break. And then we can come back and Nate, we can talk about accessory dwelling units. Yes. Okay, 819, come back at 824 and turn your video back on.
Okay, time is 8.25. If you are back from your break, if you could turn on your video and let me know you're back. And Pam, I think uh, we need to move Pam Rooney back to uh, the attendees. And Jonathan Slater too. Okay, it looks like all the board and staff are back. So time now is 826. We'll go on with the next item on the agenda. And this is an, a discussion of accessory dwelling units and introduction to the state changes regarding accessory dwelling units and possible changes to the local zoning bylaw uh, with Nate Malloy. Sure, hi everyone. Um, yeah, the state, you know, passed some new, a new definition and kind of permitting requirements for accessory dwelling units that become effective February 2nd. And, uh, you know, a number of communities are looking at changing their bylaw at town meeting or, you know, through council now. Uh, some are actually waiting. The state might, uh, they thought it would be the fall, it might come a little bit later um, to issue guidance on how, how this works. And so, you know, I think on the, the idea of it's really simple, right? Allow accessory dwelling units up to 900 square feet by right. Uh, so it just it's just a building permit. There's no you know land use permit required. Uh, and then the legislation has some language about reasonable regulations and possibly allowing more than one on a property. Uh, and, you know, there's different interpretations about what that means. Uh, and for Amherst, you know, we've permitted accessory dwelling units up to a thousand square feet. And so, uh, you know, what, you know, the idea is that that no longer complies with state regulation because it's bigger. Um, and so there's just different ideas about, you know, how all this interacts. Uh, I've attended one webinar and there's another one coming up. Um, I think I, I you know, I, I forget when I just registered today, but uh, I think in the next two weeks that will supposed to offer more guidance. Um, and so some of it really becomes, you know, really technical about how do you permit and allow accessory dwelling units. And so, you know, for Amherst, our bylaw, you know, a fair amount is compliant with the state law, but some isn't, right? We require owner occupancy, which cannot be required. Um, we require a special permit in some instances, which, um, you know, it wouldn't be allowed. Uh, and so, you know, I think for Amherst, you know, come next February, people will probably be applying for accessory dwelling units. And so, you know, right now the zoning board has denied a few requests for a duplex on the property because an owner wouldn't live there. And so it's very likely that those owners would come back and say, well, I'm just going to do a four bedroom ADU. You know, it's, it'll be a small, you know, it'll be 900 square feet, but they that's allowed by right as opposed to, you know, say a whole duplex in terms of how big the unit they were proposing. But essentially they could get the same number of occupants through this mechanism as opposed to a special permit. And so, you know, Nate, there, yes. I'm sorry, you can't do four bedrooms in 900 square feet. Why not? Or four, four, four tenants, four occupants. You think, I mean, it, wouldn't you need more room than that for to have it tolerable in terms of rent bathrooms and kitchens and living space? I mean, what if you'd had two bedrooms and you doubled up in the bedrooms? Yeah. You know, so, you know, any, anyways, okay. I think, you know, whether or not that, you know, it's four, whether it's three, but, you know, I think there's an idea that in Amherst people would take advantage of it. Um, and, I, you know, and honestly, I, you know, I, what I found online is, you know, um, Weston has a, has a bylaw they're proposing, which is pretty good. Natick has gone through it uh, or is going through it and they have a bylaw. It's pretty complicated. And then some towns just have a bylaw that basically says we'll allow ADUs according to the state definition and they don't say anything else. And so, you know, I, what I had sent in uh, preparation for this meeting was just general considerations for, you know, we do have to change the definition of accessory dwelling unit. We could have a local definition as well. You know, how do we want to permit it? 
uh, and we want to have some reasonable regulations, which is really, you know, we still have our dimensional standards and our building envelope, our lot coverage, all those things can remain. We can have additional um, kind of massing or uh, kind of some simple design guidelines. And it's yet to be tested in terms of what, when does it become unreasonable? You know, um, some limit it to one floor, some say two, some have a height requirement that's different than what they have in the bylaw. You know, all those things could be impacted. For instance, if you have it to only be one floor and someone has an existing two, you know, a, a garage and they want to put a unit above that, is that now a two story one that's not allowed? And so, you know, it's all these little pieces that have to get worked out. Um, what I, what I've thought is that, um, for November 20th, if I don't think I can get it for the six, but I'd want to have, you know, a start of a draft, some draft language or start putting the pieces together. Um, you know, one idea for Amherst is to allow, uh, ADUs that are a thousand square feet. So we already allow them to allow them in a, in a new bylaw through a permitting process. So they don't become you know, non-conforming, right? So then that way they're still there. So we, you know, they stay there. So, you know, a non-conforming use becomes kind of this special thing in state law and zoning. And so if we, if there's a way to keep the ones we permitted, which may be a few dozen to not become non-conforming, then, you know, we would want to write that into the bylaw. Um, and so, you know, the state's hoping that this ADU bylaw will, you know, encourage the production of, you know, thousands of units um, that are because of their size are, you know, modestly priced or rented, right? They're not going to be capital A affordable, but the hope is that they provide some housing uh, and housing, you know, opportunity and choice. And, you know, I think that's true. I think, you know, in some communities, um, you know, they might have, you know, might be used in ways they hadn't expected. We can uh, limit it and not allow short-term rentals. We don't, you know, I'm not sure that's a, a concern um you know it might be for some but that's something also to consider you know do we really want to you know have that kind of regulation in place uh like i said the permitting path and that what's reasonable regulations you know there's septic um issues in some communities and there's you know some areas in amherst that don't have town um you know water or sewer so there has to they have to meet you know state requirements for that um do we want some bulk and height regulations um, we cannot, you know, require owner occupancy, at least for the first ADU. And we can't have certain parking requirements uh, if the property is within a half mile. They call it a transit station. They're, again, that's people are asking, like, does that mean a bus stop? So does that mean, say, like any PVTA bus route in town? You know, does that buffer apply to every PVTA bus route? And that hasn't been clarified. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's for the planning board to discuss, you know, do we want to, you know, make a few modest changes to the existing bylaw? Do we want to rewrite a bylaw or do we don't want to do nothing? And just, you know, essentially the building commissioner would issue building permits uh, for ADUs that comply with the state definition on February 2nd and that also comply with what we have in the bylaw that isn't inconsistent with the state. Uh, so it's not like we don't have anything in place. We have some things in place, but for instance, someone wants to build a detached unit and it's a certain size and in our bylaw right now, let's say it's a special permit, it would just be a building permit. Uh, and then, you know, whatever general requirements we have that aren't in conflict with the state could still be applied, which, you know, isn't, you know, there's a few, but not all of them. So. Uh, Nate? Uh, what does Rob think we should do? He thinks we should uh, get something moving. So KP okay. Law, uh, you know, as a town attorney, they represent, you know, um, a number of communities across Massachusetts, you know, it could be like 50. Uh, Weston is one of their communities. They provided two draft bylaws. One was very simple. One was uh, kind of similar to what we have. Uh, and so, you know, like I said, there's so many different variations in what communities are doing. Some are probably cautious about what's unreasonable. So, you know, can we, you know, say we don't, we don't allow more than one ADU on a property, or if we do, it has to be by special permit. Um, you know, I will say, I think it was Weston or Natick said you could, uh, you could, they would allow two. 
by right if both are if the combined square footage of both is 900 square feet or if one was completely contained within a dwelling an existing dwelling and one could be attached or detached and so you know they're almost encouraging this kind of two adus at a time because an adu can't be uh can only be with a single family house it can't be with a duplex or any other use it's only applicable to a single family uh you know property and so you know, it's almost like if you allowed the, the two that way, someone would come in and do that. And to me, it's almost like you're doing a converted dwelling with an ADU, but the way it's permitted is through an ADU. And, you know, you limit size and one has to be completely contained within the existing dwelling. I mean, to, so for me, this community is thinking like, wow, this is a great way to actually add units and not really change the physical mass and character of properties, right? I don't know how often that would be used. You know, I don't how easy is it to create an ADU within an existing structure? You have to meet certain code requirements. I will say I've probably had half a dozen calls of property owners or prospective uh, owners asking about this. Uh, I know Rob's had a number too. You know, just questions. Two people came in today asking what's going to happen. You know, they're curious about creating one. Um, I don't know if it's new or within an existing structure, but, you know, I, I tell people that unfortunately they have to hire an architect, right? So if they have an existing garage and they think it could be an ADU, you know, there's utility connections, uh, there's, you know, building code requirements, fire separation, possible setbacks. And so a lot of things are possibilities. It's like, you know, how much can actually happen? Um, you know, I think you could require, for instance, limiting curb cuts. One town's taking that approach that you would use the existing driveway and curb cut to serve the ADU. So you don't get all these secondary curb cuts and driveways that go to the ADU. Um, you know, they can run utilities from the existing single family home, right? So they could run their sewer and connect through the home. It doesn't have to be a separate sewer connection. And so, you know, I don't know how much detail we want to go into, but, you know, if we, you know, we allow ADUs now, right? We have three categories, completely contained, attached and detached. And essentially they're almost allowed uh, by site plan or review or administrative approval. And so to me, I would make it as clean as possible and say it's by building permit. And then if we want to have some additional uh, stipulations, it would be by site plan or review. I don't know if we really need a special permit um, process, uh, but you know, I think we could have standards and conditions in the bylaw that help regulate certain things. Um, and if we really are concerned about getting multiple ADUs then maybe we prohibit that or we do make that by special permit, but that would be the one instance where, uh, you know, you might need a special permit. Like, you know, is someone gonna come in and propose like an ADU village? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I mean, it, it's a lot to build an ADU, right? I, I, to be honest, it's, it's a, you know, it's a small house, it's a small dwelling unit. Um, I, you know, I don't envision someone coming in and trying to build so many because you have building envelopes and utility connections, but you never know. Um. Okay, so um, Nate, it sounds like you're planning to come back to us in November with a draft. Yeah, and you know, if the planning board has any any general thoughts or if you've heard things or read things, you know, things for staff to consider as well. Yep, Jesse. Thanks. I was just wondering if you can remind us the process for this it goes to council and then maybe comes back or not just because February is going to be here pretty quick. Right? Yeah, I know it'd be the kind of the similar process as university drive, you know, could we turn around a draft or a, you know, a zoning amendment and bring it to council quickly enough that it's ready by February. I mean, that's a really quick turnaround. Um, yeah, we may not want to continue that hearing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I was surprised when um, one of the attorneys at KP Law said, oh, just wait till the spring and see what other communities do and when the state should have more guidance. But I think that leaves us, you know, a window where we don't really have certain regulations in place that may account for permits that come in. You know, I, you know, like, I don't know, Jesse, was it you who said, right, developers can, are creative. I'm assuming we're going to have some creative <laughs> requests that come in. Yeah, um, and sorry, that's what I was thinking about. It's like, do we, don't we want to have something in place 
yes. or almost in place by the time they start coming in with projects. Yeah, I mean, like I said, Amherst, we could, you know, at first I was thinking I'd just strike the owner occupancy from the bylaw, change the ADU size to 900 square feet and, uh, you know, only require a special permit if it's over, you know, if it's, if it's over 900, but less than a thousand. And then we've, um, there's maybe one more little change. We could, we've almost complied with the state definition and maybe, you know, that could be one route. I just feel like we're, you know, it gets a little confusing if other pieces are still not, um, you know, compliant with the state law, but, you know, it could be that I just, you know, we do that route and then also, I was thinking we'd rewrite just that section of the bylaw just to make it clean uh, and just, you know, remove what's there and replace with a new one. But... Fred? Yeah, I I would agree, Nate. Um, I think where the, where the rubber meets the road in Amherst is in a, uh, in a realm which, unfortunately, it looks like the state has prohibit us from acting, and that is in terms of owner occupancy. And that is incredibly alarming uh, in the town of Amherst, because <clears throat> when you remove owner occupancy, you remove the single most effective method of policing antisocial behavior. Uh, the, the consequences of, uh, of this and, and the potential consequences in, in, in Amherst are huge, uh, but there's probably nothing that we can do about it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> short of a home rule petition to uh, see if we can get it amended. Um, but yeah, I agree that we should probably try to be in place with something at the beginning of February. Yeah, I mean, one community didn't require owner occupancy, but they did require um, at least a 12 month lease or, you know, if it was rented a 12 month lease for the unit or units, um, which is different than saying it can't be a short term rental. And so, you know, I don't know, you know, if that is voted on by their town meeting, how that would, you know, how the state will review that eventually, right? It's to say it's not a short term rental means, you know, doesn't mean you have to have, have a 12 month lease or, uh, will the state review you're talking about, will that be through litigation in the courts or is there some state agency that will review this? Yeah, so, you know, I think that there are a number of town meetings that are in their special fall town meeting are voting on a bylaw and then it'll go to the attorney general's office for review. And so it's at that point that, you know, the state, when they're reviewing the, the article, you know, the you know, the proposed bylaw, they might make an opinion that it's not uh, consistent with the legislation. So I don't know what kind of approach they'll take, right? So it could be that there, there is, you know, 30 fall town meetings happening across Massachusetts at this time where bylaws are being adopted for ADUs and, you know, for, for you know, for town meeting, then they review those. So they'll actually review the language. Um, and I don't know if they'll take the approach of, you know, saying some are not compliant with state law because they over, you know, they provide unreasonable regulations. Okay. But I think, you know, other communities are waiting to see, right? I think the hope is then by, unfortunately, if you wait, you don't have anything in place by February 2nd, right? So it's like, we could wait a few months, mm -hmm. see if there's all these determinations made and then come up with a bylaw, but then we'll, you know, we'll, you know, that by that point, it probably wouldn't be ready until spring, right? It just, you lose that window. Fred? Uh, yeah, I think we do both. Um, we try to be in place for February and we keep actively thinking about it. And, uh, you know, if something moves on the state level, then, you know, we can move you know, in, in, in uh, our council. Yep. That sounds like the right approach. <clears throat> okay, Nate, anything else you wanted from us this evening? 
Uh, no, that's good. Yeah. So I think it's November 4th. There's another webinar I'll go to that should have some guidance. So that gives us enough time to have something, you know, hopefully for the 20th. Okay. Great. All right, next we have a what we call a general housing discussion. Um, Fred, your hand is still up. I don't, I don't know if you wanted to say anything before we moved on. I just put it back up uh, and it was in response to Nate. Uh, uh, Nate, could you, uh, I, I'm assuming that members of the planning board could attend that webinar. Could you make that available to planning board members, the timing and so forth on that? Yeah, I'll forward you a link. You'll have to register. It's pretty easy. Um, and then it's a Zoom webinar. It's hosted by uh, actually the state uh, and I think um, MMA. So yeah. All right. If 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 I'm a, if I'm around, I think I would like to uh, participate or at least. Yeah, I think it's 10 a.m. on November 4th. Okay. So next uh, November fourth, that would be Monday, right? Yeah, I was thinking it was further away, but I guess it's only it's Monday. Next Monday. Next yeah. Week. I was thinking it was for yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Send it out soon. Yeah. Yeah. It just came through this afternoon at like three or four. So um Okay. Fred, your hand is up. Uh, is that a legacy? Okay, great. Okay, moving on to the general housing discussion, item five on the agenda. The time is 8.47. Um, this was my attempt to make a time during our meeting for us to talk about some of the same things that the housing subcommittee has been talking about. Uh, hopefully, uh, with wider participation of the committee or of the board. Uh, obviously, we don't have everybody tonight. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, Jesse, I gave you a few hours uh, notice that this was on the agenda. Um, it sounded like last time you said you were talking a lot about trying to define a student rental. Um, maybe you could fill us in on kind of how you were approaching that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so not much has progressed. Uh, we were not able to meet last week just for quorum reasons. Uh, we're meeting on the 13th, I think is next. And yeah, so we had spent a fair bit of time in the first meetings talking about, do we wanna try and have a student home definition on our books somehow? And what the utility would be and if so, what would that definition look like? And pretty much where the subcommittee landed was, yes, we'd like to try and do that as a information gathering tool. So the last couple of times the full board discussed these types of issues, um, a big piece of what felt like was missing was data, right? Understanding where the student homes are in the town so that we can start to think about neighborhoods that might have too much density or different, even to, to begin to discuss strategies to mitigate what we think is too much, you have to know what there is. So that was really the motivation in coming up with a definition that could potentially be adopted by the town somewhere in the, the, the bylaws. Um, what we ended on and uh, I could send it to Nate who can send it to everybody was basically stealing the language from somewhere else that has had it on their bylaw for quite some time. And presumably if it was challenged, it stood up or maybe it wasn't challenged, we don't know, but that felt like an easy route. And so we made some minor modifications, um, but it's basically just describing what we consider a student home. And it's a certain, so I think it was two or more occupants that are uh, attending university or college, I can't remember the exact words. Again, I could pull it up or, or I can just send it around for you all to look at. We haven't really progressed much further what to do with this yet because um, we were debating what happens if we try and push this forward without a purpose. We're concerned that the 
there will be big objection to it because it will be viewed as just a tool in a, to be used in a negative way, meaning an anti-student piece of definition. That's not at all our intention, but we're concerned that that will be how it's viewed. So I think where we ended last was trying to come up with a proposed use as information gathering rather than just, yes, let's add this definition. If were, that... you, were you thinking that this would be added to like the questionnaire that you fill out for the rental registration bylaw? It uh, so, it, so it wouldn't be a definition that's part of our zoning code. It would be something that would be more broadly in the town bylaw. Correct, more broadly in the town bylaw. And we did discuss whether it, we could just simply add it to the, the re registration form. And Nate, help me remember where we landed on that. It was basically, the thought was it, it wouldn't give us much more information that we're already getting because that's then relying on the registrant's accurate, honest answer, right? And so I think we already asked on there number of occupants right mm -hmm. so it yeah, might not the, yeah the building commissioner said it could be added to the you know it's our our online software for rental permitting but you know it's a kind of an on you know an on honorary system so they you know an applicant doesn't have to indicate um but we thought we could add it um you know yeah i i think the new rental registration um you know the online software is easier to complete. And so, you know, we thought that that's a good place to have this live at first because it, you know, um, it auto renews and it's capturing who's already renting. Um, and so it is a, it can be a, it could be a data collection point, um, you know, in addition to what the, the, the system's already collecting. But I, I you know, I, I do think it's important. So, you know, I was talking to uh, Rob Moore about it now in terms of how many, you know, single family homes or duplexes are, Part of the rental registration and then we can determine i think we do ask how many occupants but we don't actually know you know how many are say students or undergraduate students and so we could you know probably take a guess but you know you know or if the home is rented you know who knows right if it's all the occupants are students or some or half you know but we know the occupants uh so this could just be another point to help understand the data um and but yeah, if I can add another point, what gets really tricky that we've discussed at length also is, you know, one of the goals we, the subcommittee stated for itself was to try and increase permanent residential rentals. Not just to limit student rentals, like that's not really the goal, it's to encourage and increase permanent resident rentals as well. And so that's also part of trying to define what's a student home. And, and that, so it just, it, it feels pretty tricky to navigate how to gather the information, where this definition should live and how it would be used, right? So that's where we're at with that discussion. All right, are there other topics you guys have talked about? Um, we just the ADU law a, a bit, a couple of times. We've sort of been waiting for more information from the state. Obviously we just discussed that here. Uh, we were on our agenda and Nate can probably speak more to this is revisiting I don't know if it was a plan or just a discussion that was had some number of years ago about increasing density at already existing multi-use multi-family uh, mm -hmm. sites around town um, and and rezoning those for how much higher density seemed yeah. like I mean that that to me seemed like a no-brainer like why wouldn't we do that as a right. way it's just well, some that, that could be the next thing we take on so we were going to try and look at that as a subcommittee to bring a proposal to the full board, um, or at least flesh out the discussion a little bit. Um, and then, you know, on the back end of our agenda, which we haven't really gotten to yet, for the subcommittee was, again, starting to think about the next potential overly place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that, that really sums up what we've been up to. Okay. So is it, would it, it sounds like you have another meeting scheduled on the 13th. Um, is if we can make a regular time available there in this meeting, is it, would that help you not, you know, would that make you guys feel like we, you don't have to meet separately or, I mean. I think so. I, I would certainly welcome fewer meetings. You know, we, we have a, 
we're having, you know, we have some difficulty scheduling just mm -hmm. like everything else. So, yeah, I think that would be a big plus. Okay. Um, so Nate, you know, based on what you can see coming up in the next couple of months, um, do you think it's, uh, it's feasible for us to try to carve an, you know, 45 minutes or an hour out of each meeting for a housing conversation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was going to say that, um, well, just to respond to Jesse, I think back to what the housing subcommittee was talking about too, is, you know, if, and it was mentioned in the comprehensive housing study from 2015, you know, if there's areas where you have flexible zoning or allow multi-unit development, can you have, you know, stricter regulations in some part of town. And so some communities that, you know, Bruce had looked at and the committee has talked about briefly, you know, in some areas they, you know, regulate pretty strictly, you know, the number of unrelated occupants in a unit and other things, but then in other parts of the community, they actually encourage, you know, say student housing, because these are all college towns he's looking at, right? So they're taking, you know, kind of a multifaceted approach. So it's not just like, well, let's just do one thing. They're trying to do a few different things to accommodate, you know, different users and, and you know, residents in the community. So I think that, you know, it is always something to consider. Um, you know, I think Doug, you mentioned, right, that the U University Drive could help a bit to me, right? That's a starting point and there's other things that could be happening. So to your question about the next meetings, November 6th right now, uh, 422 Amity Street has been continued, the site plan review. I will say that the Conservation Commission continued their hearing to November 13th on that, and it might um, result in uh, some site changes. And so the idea was to just not even take any testimony or anything on the 6th and just continue it to a date certain, possibly November 20th or Decem into December. So that basically leaves November 6th um, completely open for, you know, which is just, you know, a week away, but open for housing discussion. Uh, November 20th, I had, you know, 422 Amity, the site plan review. Um, we have the, um, the public hearing and then the ADU bylaw. So, you know, November 20th is kind of busy. December 4th, there's two site plan review or two projects. And then December 18th is um, pretty much uh, open at this point as well. So, you know, November 6th and December 18th, uh, you know, and even at the other meetings, it seems like there could be time to have some top, some discussion like this. Okay. All right. Well, I guess the other thing that's coming to mind is early on when we started talking about what eventually turned into the overlay, we met in person and we kind of sat around a table and people seemed to find that productive, um, you know, is that necessary, I guess is the question. Um, or can we have a fruitful conversation about, you know, where to go next uh, over Zoom? Jesse? I, I mean, I think I enjoy being in person, but at the same time, I think we could probably do it over Zoom, be my thought, especially okay. if we're going to pick off discrete chunks for each meeting and not just have a very open, let's yeah. look at a map. Discussion. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, would it be reasonable for us to say, well, maybe the next thing we might talk about in that slot would be areas with multifamily housing we could upzone? I uh, think that's great. Yeah. Uh, Johanna? I think, I mean, I guess I'd be interested in having a slightly broader conversation about like, what are the options for the next thing that we could pick up? Because East Amherst and like that right. Route 9 corridor was also kind of the next thing in a way. So I do think it makes sense to pick one, but I'd be interested in having a conversation about the pros and cons. Of okay, the Jesse? Yeah, I don't disagree. This one, this other idea that Nate brought to us seemed really, potentially really straightforward if everyone was on board. That's okay. why it, it feels like next to me because it might be a relatively short process, <laughs> which which I would love. <laughs> well, Annette, you're an optimist. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so maybe we'll put that on the that on the agenda for for the sixth, uh, just next week, and um, I guess we'll be finalizing the agenda for that probably tomorrow. Uh, Johanna, given that that has been kind of discussed and is a little bit of an idea, is there anything in writing that we could read ahead of time, Jesse? That you know of? Uh, no, Nate, you could forward what you sent to us. It was just the plan, some uh, a little bit of a plan from when, whenever it was, 2015. Yeah, I'll, well, whatever. I sent a few things to the housing subcommittee that can become part of the packet. And so, yeah, the town, uh, the planning department at that time had said, you know, look at um, properties that had, you know, multi-unit development and could they could there be an overlay to allow them to redevelop at a much greater density and some of that, the reasoning there is that a lot of those apartment complexes were permitted and then the town changed the zoning. So now they're pre-existing or now they're non-conforming so they can densify anyways under the bylaw through a special permit. But could you, you know, encourage it as a site plan review, you know, again, with some standards and conditions in place. And so, you know, there's there's been a few property owners over the last few years, I guess, who come to town and say they could they'd be willing to do something like that. Some wouldn't because, you know, we've actually, I've spoken to one about it um, and they, they said maybe, but, you know, in terms of taking units offline for construction and then phasing, you know, some property owners just don't want to take on that kind of comp complex project, right? They, you know, it makes sense in the long run, but I think there's a few that I, you know, Rob said there's a few that periodically check in and say, you know, can I do something with my property? I'd love to, you know, densify. And right now there's not really a good way to do that. So. Okay. That was kind of the idea of it. It never made it, you know, past, you know, some there at the time there was a zoning subcommittee, there was discussions, like Jesse said, there were some maps and maybe some notes, but nothing formal ever, you know, came out of it. Okay. Um, one thing that I was wondering uh, with the, is there, now that you have the rental registration bylaw, uh, is there a way with the magic of GIS to translate the information about where rental units are onto a map so that we could see just how is rental distributed across town? Is it really all around UMass or is it everywhere? Yeah, <clears throat> good question. It will be mapped. Um, you know, what I've been told is that there's often a lag between when, um, you know, permit, you know, we, the way we have accepted applications, they say they're due in July, but we allowed, you know, some grace period. And then there's a few months where uh, the town double checks. And so usually we'd say by, you know, end of year is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the idea is that then it could be mapped. I will say about right now, um, I think there's like seven, almost 800, I think it's like 790 single, fam single family homes are registered with the rental registration program meaning that it's more than just one bedroom that's rented out and there's 200 duplexes. Uh, so, um, and I think a hundred of those duplexes are, um, you know, half are owner occupied and half aren't. And so, you know, that's, you know, essentially 900, you know, you could call them single family, one or two family units that are, you know, probably the entire unit is rented, right? All, all bedrooms. Yeah. Um, and that should be able to be mapped. Um, so, you know, what the idea is that our, um, the software is tied to, you know, we tie it to an address and a property ID. So eventually that should all be mapped and it could, you know, there could be some symbology to, you know, show the different variations. If we start getting more granular data, you know, you could hopefully represent that too as well. Well, that would be great. Uh, Jesse. I would just add, well, it never was a year ago when I first joined the board and I put together those percentile numbers from neighborhoods. There was a big disconnect from the registration numbers and the numbers on the property cards where I got that data. So just putting that caveat out there for everyone to keep in the back of their minds, like 790 registered now, if I remember correctly, there were 1100 or so on the book from somewhere. So that's a pretty big Delta percentage wise. Just that we'll have to, we'll always contend with that, but it is what it is. Yeah, I would say that the rental registration moving forward um, will become more accurate. You know, I think what the town is, does is it takes 
anything that was a rental registration property a, a year or two before, and then they will follow up if they don't register the next year, right? So then they try to make sure they're always uh, accurate. With the assessor's information, you know, it's a, whether there's a change, you know, the property changes hands or is every so many years, three to five years where they will kind of reassess the property. And so some of that, that information is outdated. And unfortunately, I don't know if it'll ever be synchronized in a way like Jesse, you know, we were asking, I, you know, I was trying to work with him to map it and it was just, you know, it was too inconsistent. Um, you know, and the margin of error was pretty big. And so it was hard to say, well, let's look at this information. I think it's, it might be helpful, but, you know, knowing that it could be a 20 to 30%, you know, margin of error, what does that mean in a given area? Um, but. Okay, Jesse? Just wanted to say, to be clear, that was in no way a criticism of the town and what they're doing. I mean, <laughs> it was just an acknowledgement of probably people choosing not to use the registration, that's all. Okay. Oh, no, I mean, no, it's fair, right? There's an older, for instance, there's an older property for sale that the assessor list is a three family. And it was a three family probably a number of years ago, but in the last so many years, it's really only been a duplex. And it's just, you know, the assessor's records never caught up with that change, right? So this area that was a third unit just kind of became part of one of the units. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's, it's just, you know, we don't, the assessor doesn't go out and inspect units, you know, so consistently to know that. Um... Okay. All right, great. Uh, it's 9.06, maybe we can go on to the next item. Nate, you were gonna talk about the housing production plan. Yeah, so the, um, you know, the town's hired Barrett consulting group, Judy Barrett and her firm is working through a housing production plan. They've had you know, some meetings, uh, they've met maybe with some of you, they're conducting the needs assessment right now. And that dot, that portion of the plan should be completed in the next two weeks and would, would be available for review. Uh, there also will be a, um, an online survey for, for residents and community members to take that should be ready by the end of the week. So that'll be available online. Ask a number of questions in terms of, you know, an, uh, you know um, a respondent's housing situation, you know, demographics and what they, think our needs for housing in the community, what they'd like to see. So I'd encourage everyone to take it and forward it along to everyone. Um, and I think the needs assessment, you know, was a 50 to 60 page piece of the plan that, you know, really is trying to understand the housing market in Amherst and then the need for affordable housing. So a housing production plan is really focused on, you know, capital A affordable need, but they also look at other um, housing needs in the town. I think eventually the planning board has to send a letter with the plan to the state if we want to get it approved. And so the idea is that the plan would be done by next July. And so, you know, I just want to give a periodic update to the planning board. And eventually, you know, you'd probably be asked to review the plan and then vote to, I don't know if it, approve it or, um, I, I forgot the exact language, but then that, you know, your letter and vote would go along with the plan to the state. So uh, okay. and there is, I think it's December 10th, or third, I'm not sure yet, but on either of those dates, there'll be a, um, a number of in-person meetings to discuss the, um, the plan, mo mostly the needs assessment and the results of the community survey. And so, you know, the public is more than welcome to attend. I'm not sure, we, we haven't finalized the date, we're hoping to do that in the next week, but so it's either the, the third or the 10th, and there'll be a series of workshops, you know, from two to six, um, you know, in, in town, whether it's in town hall or in another meeting space. But. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Nate. Next, let's see, we went through old business. We went through new business, Form A and R, ZBA, SPA, SPP, SUB, uh, we went through the committee and liaison reports. All right, we're up to report of chair and I really don't, don't have a report tonight. I'm looking forward to having the full board at a meeting sometime soon. Doesn't feel like we've done that much lately for somehow. Uh, Nate and Pam, anything on report of staff? No, I don't. 
uh, have anything. I will say in the next you know few meetings of the planning board, there'll be a number of discussions about University Drive. There's the overlay, there's 422 Amity Street, and then 422 Amity Street has submitted a preliminary subdivision plan to freeze the zoning. So, um, you know, it could be that the board has questions, the public may have questions, um, and there's probably another project with University Drive. And so there's a lot of University Drive uh, in the agenda and what's being talked about. Um, so just, you know, email staff if there's questions or if you, you know, are confusing projects or, if, you know, the public asks you questions, you can direct them to staff. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else? Um, anybody wants to talk about? It's 10 after 9 now. All right. Uh, thank you all, especially Karen, for giving us some time from her time out on the West Coast. So nine it's 9-11 and we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Doug. Good night, everyone. Good night. Night, Pam. I always struggle to find the end the recording. I don't know where it is. It disappears. I'm All just right. gonna I'm gonna hang us up. We'll see you soon. Right. Bye.